Welcome to the second part of our discussion of uh, Central and Eastern Europe in the period uh, leading up to 1400. In, uh, in the previous lecture we discussed up to the year 1000, which is basically the, the time of settlement and the formation of the first more stable political units in this area, <coughs> if we discount the Dacians, of course. Um, and uh, today, so we'll take it from the year 1000 to the year 1400, again trying to mark out the more important events and developments in terms of what interests us, uh, meaning uh, culture, society and politics. Uh, so, uh, and looking for the commonalities, but also trying to remember some of the important figures, because these are the figures and events, because these are the figures and events that will be crucial in defining what it does it mean to be a Serbian, a Polish person, or whatever, and also to then shape the later uh, modern state. Uh, so let's let's try to look at, uh, at uh, again, with the help of, of uh, the materials posted on Canvas, I posted a new set of materials, uh, maps and other materials uh, regarding this period, and of course based on your reading from the chapters, from Fruit, right? This is the lecture is meant to kind of uh, link these various chunks of information uh, and, and uh, uh, create uh, connections. Uh, okay, so uh, the Polish, um, right? The, the the Polish state, a Polish state was formed uh, around the 9th, 10th century, right? Um, <coughs> and uh, the important uh, first important dynasty, Polish, uh, was. Uh, the Piast dynasty yeah, in the 11th century. Um, and the Boleslav in the 1035 is the first king of Poland. Now, an important moment here, which is common for the whole uh, area, it will be the German colonization. When I say German, I'm talking about Germanic groups, right? Germanic groups. Uh, the very identity of German, as we know today, is a product of much later, uh, the much later point of, uh, in history. And the Poles, right, so let's look at the 11th century. And if you can not see it clearly and this map does then use, uh, obviously use uh, in the video lecture, this is why you have the maps on your canvas. So while you're watching this video lecture, use that. Uh, so this is 1050. You see uh, here, well, a sort of a Poland again, oh, boundaries not as solid as we have them today. Um, but you see uh, that, uh, again, it is uh, a unit, or you can see it here, right, a unit which is in between other, you know, competing powers, and, you know, it's throughout history between the German or Germanic pressure or influence and the uh, Eastern Slavic. At this point there is no Russia, so on the later it will be there. The point is that uh, Germans who, you know, uh, will settle and will be invited to settle in many of the lands of Central and Eastern Europe. So, ethnic German or Germanic uh, populations will exist then as from as early as the 11th century, but this process will continue to go on. And they will be invited to settle in for various reasons, but often it was because they brought with them specific uh, knowledge, uh, specific uh, uh, professions, uh, they were invited to play a specific role in society. And that will be common in other lands as well. Uh, this is very important because uh, later when the modern state of Germany will be formed and you will have all these ethnic German uh, um, populations in many parts of Central and Eastern Europe who have lived there for eight, nine centuries, not part of Germany proper, which is here. Well, will be here 800 years later. So, uh, a key moment then is the um, moment when uh, uh, a more stable state is formed, uh, you see you have a greater Poland, um, uh, a lesser Poland, uh, again, why? Because you have different competing uh, princes, right, uh, and uh, you know, a, diamond, uh, a king who has two sons and they squabble and they divide their authority, so yeah, the modern state doesn't exist, the modern state is state that we have today in which you know the border for the only reason that you know the border is that when you go there, there's a border patrol and when you come in, you will have police, the same police everywhere, right? And you will send the same administration, the same taxation system. What are these? These are the institutions of the modern state. But these are invented in the 19th century, okay? This is a very recent invention. 
And when you look at the map of the world today, we see that the whole world is now neatly divided into patches of different colors. They don't exist, in, in fact, right? You fly over the, the land, you don't see these patches of different colors. You don't see borders, right? We always say that, you know, it's a common saying that the borders are invented. But to, to, logically, they are not invented, but constructed. Because they are the, the limits of the reach of a certain government. But the reach is done through institutions. In order to, but these institutions, the bureaucracy of various kinds, the, the standing military, are inventions of the last two centuries. Okay? So throughout history, neither in Western Europe, nor here, nor anywhere in the world did you have such governments that had the resources capacity, which are brought only by the modern means of translocation and communication, to control the whole territory. Right? Call 911, it shows up, right, from the other corner of the whatever it is, right? So, this is why these limits change, because not even in Western Europe, this thing didn't exist until the 19th century, not, never, never in the world. The modern state is a, well, the name suggests it's a modern invention. So you have to understand this when we talk about fluctuating borders. This is also important why this whole sphere is part of Christianity, not because they went to church every Sunday, although at a certain point in the Middle Ages this was indeed a common practice, or they were in, in, uh, internally devout, we don't know. I mean, we know that there many were, but I'm sure many were not. What is common, why Christianity is, is important, because it gives, a sense, it gives us a, a common uh, fundamental set of values, and because it gives a common fund, uh, set of institutions. And this is why Christianity was important. It's a, like a con it is a constitution of the land, of the area. So Western Europe and, and the, it shared in a way a constitution. So it didn't matter where you drew the borders, the constitution was the same, the basic values were the same. It's only the individual rulers who were different. Same then in Eastern Europe, what we call later Eastern Europe, which, or the area that falls under uh, Eastern Christianity Orthodox, because it's the same thing. But there it's a different sort of Christianity, a different sort of sets of values, organization of society, and so on. Of course, overlapping this is a, is a, a different political culture that forms here, a different political culture that forms in the Byzantine Empire. That's the, that's uh, the subject that we're dealing with uh, a little bit later. But you have to understand these notions because it's, it's wrong to project backward what our understanding of what the state is, of what the you know, uh, country is, uh, and there are these fixed borders. They're not. They aren't. Look at the map. They never existed. Right? These are recent inventions in the history of the world. Okay. Um, so, after this point, uh, where you have these uh, uh, different uh, divisions, an important moment is when uh, these uh, territories are unified and you have a more stable uh, uh, Poland. So, by 1300, you see, you have the more stable. What, why was it stable? It was because, it was because they had a, a dynasty, as I mentioned yesterday. A dynasty is the guarantee of continued authority over a territory, right? Today we have institutions that persist. The institution of the presidency, the institution of the constitution, the institution of Congress in the United States and so on. No matter who populates them, they're not going to say that once Speaker Boehner resigns or President Obama is no longer in power, that presidency doesn't exist anymore, right? The institutions are what maintain the government and the form of government, not the people. The people come in and go out. But the same with the dynasty, right? Um, so unified statehood is guaranteed by a common rule. This is why in history often you will have these, some of these states borrowing rules, rulers from each other, or asking the neighboring ruler to come and rule here for a while until they establish, they re-establish the dynasty. How could they have that? You invite someone else to rule you? Yes, because it was. Uh, it, it was a, a way of ensuring that there is a continuity of authority. And because in the local, uh, in the given situation, the local dynasty maybe died out, and this was a friendly dynasty, and which had the authority, the resources, the, 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 the financial, military, whatever, to, to impose its authority, or just its name was respected. Okay? So that happens often in history between Hungary and Poland, by the way. These states borrowed each other's rulers often. Also, this is why they married each other's daughters and so on. Because you borrowed from, you got, uh, borrowed or got from the other state's authority. 
it's like lending a military support or whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, but not just support, but also legitimacy. And that will happen often. Okay, so speaking of, of that, um, uh, Casimir the Great, who is the king of Poland after 1333 uh, AD, uh, who expands his territory, his cousin was the king of Hungary. By the way, most of the dynasties of Europe were and still are related. So when you have a big event in the family of the monarch of the Great Britain, who by the way the family is from Netherlands, originally in the 17th century, right? you see all the crowned heads of Europe passed uh, in power, like King of Spain, or not in power, like King of Romania, right? no longer a monarchy in Romania, uh, but they show up because they are actually related. They are actually related. Anyway, um, so when Casimir the Great, whose cousin was the King of Hungary, dies in 1330, uh, in, the, in the middle of the 14th century, guess who gets the crown? The crown goes to Louis de Anjou, who was the King of Hungary, who remains then a, both King of Hungary and also will rule over Poland. It will not become one state. They will be, it will be just this king also giving its author, his authority to the state of, of Poland. Right? Um, and a similar thing happens in 1385. The famous, famous Polish-Lithuanian uh, Union. And this lasted for a long time. And look at this state, the largest state, well, it, well not again, I'm just to think of this as how far authority spread, right? Uh, but not like, okay, here you had police and the same police was run by the center, no. Right? There's, no such, such, there's no postal system covering the entire territory, there's no borders, border guard system and whatever, military covering the entire territory. But the center could expand its rule, could claim its rule up to this region through the nobles who lived in these regions. And the nobles acquiesced to the rule of the given king. By the way, in Poland, this is very important, uh, there develops a, a system by which it's the nobles who elect the king, and this will become clearer later. But even now, it, instead of having a dynasty, you have a stable system of nobles who constitute the political nation of Poland. It's the nobles who are the political body of Poland, or of Poland and Lithuania. And they give the crown to a king. Now this is a different system than the dynastic system, and it has its problems. But it will become very important, uh, you know, later uh, in history, also when the, the debate about the formation of the modern states uh, comes about. So anyway, Poland and Lithuania. This is a personal union. What, what does personal union mean? It means that these two lands, meaning who? The nobles within each of the two lands, because they're the ones who can grant this authority or take it back. So the nobles of these two lands agree to give the crown, the two different crowns, to the same person. And that's a personal union. Right? So it doesn't mean that they have the same systems of, uh, that, that the king has one administrative system over the entire territory. Because the, the, the laws remain different and the, the, the institutions in each set, uh, uh, land remains different, but what is common is the ruler. But this Polish between you, uh, uh, personal union will later become an actual union. But again, notice how it's the largest state in Europe. Poland was, will become, and remain one of the largest and most powerful states in Europe and one of the greatest threats, for example, to the Eastern Slav, what will become the Russians. They always fought them and they invaded them, even take, took, took the crown in Moscow and so on. Okay? So one of the big powers in the Middle Ages. Hence, you can imagine how great a tragedy it would be when in the 18th, 19th century, Poland would disappear. So Poland Lithuania was a person, you know, a huge, a great power. This is also the beginning of the Jagiellonian. Famous universities in Poland, the Jagiellonian, actually in Vilnius, in Lithuania, the Jagiellonian uh, University, one of the oldest also in the world. Um, so the Jagiellonian dynasty is, uh, is created by actually a marriage between the uh, ruler in Poland and the woman uh, ruler in Lithuania. The Jagiellonian dynasty, one of the famous dynasties in Polish history. And with that, we get to 400, so I'm not going to go further than that. Well, let's talk about the uh, the Czechs, or the 
the Czech lands. Well, we talked about the Czechs, uh, and again, remember that when we talk about Czech history, we're actually talking about two different provinces, Bohemia and Moravia. We say Czech because we start from the reality of today, but we project backwards. So, Bohemia and Moravia. And they are were different uh, uh, provinces. And remember that we talked about the fact that the dynasty was a dynasty where we established a Persian Missile dynasty. Right? This is when, so we're back into the Europe, uh, for, uh, to the 11th century. Uh, this is when uh, the Czechs uh, are Christianized, we talked about Cyril and Method and so on. This is also, you know, it's always dynastic succession, is always a problem, so there's one event when one of the um, uh, princes, uh, uh, you know, to their, their, his successors fight with each other and Václav, uh, one of his sons, is killed by, uh, if I remember correctly, the other son. Well, this guess what? This Vatsana become is is uh, killed, but he was going to church, and he becomes actually a saint, and we all know it as King Venceslas, right? So, good King Venceslas, right? Uh, that there's that Christmas song, right? That that's where it comes from. Okay, uh, it's very important that uh, remember at this point these are princes, not kings, right? This this meant that their rank in relationship with the other rulers in Europe was not as high, right? So when you recognize as a king, it's different than when you recognize as a prince. Uh, it's a you know, governor, president, right? So um, the key thing here is uh, the relationship of the Czech lands, let's say, we call them that, Bohemia Moravia with this thing here, which was the Holy Roman Empire. Well, it wasn't Roman. It was called Roman as a reference to what used to be, you know, Empire, meaning that they kind of hearkened as a model to that, but it had nothing to do with that. Right? The Holy Roman Empire was actually made of, com composed mostly of Germanic, Germanic peoples. Right? This is why it was called the Holy Roman Empire of, of German language. Right? But again, German language is not yet established either. But anyway, the Holy Roman Empire was not actually an empire, but it was, uh, or it was for about two centuries, but after that it becomes a sort of a federation or let me put it this way, confederation, because what you will have, in fact, let me uh, try to show you the more, that's what you do, that's what you have. This is the Holy Roman Empire. It's not one thing, it's a patchwork of hundreds of bishoprics and princedoms and duchies and, and so on, who formally, of whom about, what was it, seven or nine electors, or rulers with the right to elect, elected from time to time an emperor. So you see, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire was just a sort of an honorific, honorary title. You know? At first, in the first centuries, it had more power, but then, as the units became more powerful than the emperor, then it became just this formal title, to, to a large degree. Uh, more imp less and less important up to in the 19th century, when uh, uh, it, it ends. Right. So that was the Holy Roman Empire. But anyway, in the first two centuries, let's say up to 1200, this is the center of authority and of power. So, so when you are in the year in the 11th century here, so let's say year 1000 or, or 1050, this is a center of authority. So when the first Hungarian king is crowned, he gets his crown, crown his recognition both from the Holy Roman Emperor, who was one of the, the most powerful source of authority in Europe at that point, and from the Pope, who was the most powerful source of authority uh, in terms of uh, you know, religion. It's like the Supreme Court versus, and the uh, UN both give you the crown. Right? That's, that's how you should understand it. Right. So for the Czechs who were around in this, this uh, area, for, the, for these rulers, for these princes, being so close as they are, you see here, uh, being as close as they are to, let's see if I can, um, yeah, this is not clear enough. Well, the Czechs would be somewhere, the, the Bohemia and Moravia should be somewhere, somewhere like this. Now, 
There it is. This is bad. This is bad. You see Bohemia, right? This is 1300. So you see that Bohemia is becomes one of the parts in a way, well, or it becomes associated, and the Czechs will remain associated, that's my point, throughout their most of their history with the Germans in a somewhat cozy relationship. Cozier than the Poles, who had their own strong country for most of history, and stronger than the Hungary, which also had their own state. The state, the Czechs would be closer related to the German, Germanic uh, princedoms, duchies, and so on, both uh, uh, because of their situation, also because of being a, a smaller people, Bohemia being a smaller territory, never having a strong enough state of their own, or, or rarely, uh, although it was, you know, independent or whatever, it had its own, you know, statehood, it was associated within this system of relationships that we call, we just call the Holy Roman Empire, okay? So, for example, the Czech ruler could be one of the electors of the emperor at a certain point. Or the son of the emperor became the Czech ruler. And this happens in Czech uh, history. So that's what I want to point in this out, is the close relationship with the Holy Roman Empire, meaning with the Germanic uh, peoples. Uh, in 1212 you have a hereditary monarchy in Bohemia, uh, so you have the establishment of a sort of a continuous uh, monarchy. Uh, remember the Persian uh, dynasty. They also actively attract German settlers in, in Czech lands. Now these lands also had much more space than there is today. Uh, um, so, you know, attracting settlers was actually, just like in the beginning of the US colonies, you know, there was active policy of attracting people to come to this continent because there was the need for workforce and for people who were able and so on. Uh, the golden age of Bohemia is in the, the 14th century when Charles of Luxembourg, remember you know, the name of Luxembourg, that's not in the Czech lands, right? Well yes, because he was the son of the, um, um, uh, he was related to the Holy Roman Emperor, he actually comes to the Bohemian throne and also becomes Holy Roman Emperor. This is a period of glory, the capital is already in Prague, you know, uh, and this is one of the moments when, you know, it, it, it flourishes as a, you know, renaissance uh, capital. Okay, so let's move to, to Hungary. Let's all move to Hungary. So the year 1000 is basically noted as the year when King Stephen Stephen of Hungary, also known as Saint Stephen for uh, in the Catholic Church, he unifies the lands and put them, puts them under a stronger central rule. Now his dad already, his father already did that to a large degree, but he's the one who, he was a Christian, uh, uh, King Stephen, and also Christianizes the land, uh, the Hungarians, and instates a more powerful, more centralized rule. And indeed establishes Hungary as a state, uh, year 1000, um, which is celebrated the 1000th anniversary of state within the year 2000, right? Um, and he's crowned as king, remember, who do you get, who, someone needs to recognize you, right? And he's recognized, he's crowned by, through the authority of the Otto, the Holy Roman Emperor, the year 1000, and the uh, Pope, and the Pope. That's, uh, so, so with this, the importance of this historical is that he binds, so, you know, in order to have statehood and be recognized, you need to have a system of alliances. Even today, your rec I mentioned this, that your recognition as a state is a matter of being recognized by other states. We talked about Kosovo. Kosovo is a state now from part of what used to be the former Yugoslavia, which is recognized by quite a good number of states around the world, but not all. And the UN which can be considered to be kind of the ultimate forum for recognizing states, right? does not recognize Kosovo yet. So are you a state or aren't you a state? And there are other territories in the world which, uh, which claim to be states but have not been recognized not even by other states or just by a couple. You know? So this is always the same thing because someone needs to recognize that you're a state. And the US Declaration of Independence, remember that in the last part, it's written to with, is a plea to the other states in the world to recognize this new state. That's what it says in the introduction, in the conclusion. Read it. 
So this is a huge moment, right? This is a huge moment. Um, the, uh, he establishes the Arpad dynasty, well after him it is established the Arpad dynasty, so King Stephen, so we got Hungary, 1000, statehood. Well notice, uh, yeah, and uh, King Stephen, Saint Stephen, but then, and then you have the Arpad dynasty, who is the longest lasting, you know, uh, flourishing dynasty in, the, in Hungary between the year 1000 and 1300. A very strong state. This is a period, let's just look at the map, between 1000 and 1300. So 1000, let's go to 1050. And notice, you know, commonality. Notice how Hungary expands. 1050, and I also uh, posted other, so here's, here's Hungary in the year 1360. Now it's definitely not the Hungary that we, that we have today. Uh, for example, in the year after 1100, and we talk about this when we get to Croatia, Croatia becomes historically part of the Hungarian state. There's a separate entity that part of the Hungarian state, and throughout history, well, for about a thousand years, it will be associated with the crown of Hungary. Croatia, Croatia, as a separate entity but part of it. The Slovaks all fall under Hungarian rule, under the Hungarian state, they will be there for a thousand years. Okay? Transylvania will be in and out of the Hungarian state. Okay. Another important, so it's, it's a huge in, in, in expansion and for many, uh, quite a good number of centuries, Hungary will be one of the strongest states in, in Europe, not just in Central uh, Europe. Um, dominating the neighboring uh, areas as well. Uh, an important factor here is, is the rise of the nobles. And this is a dynamic that goes on throughout, well, in more, and it can read Shakespeare. Okay? It's all about nobles allying with each other to, and claiming a throne for one of them, and the, the, the battles between these different factions. Right? And the battles between the nobles and the king. And one of the greatest, one of the most important documents one of the important documents of political history is the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta, they say, oh, the rights, civil rights. No, it's actually, it are privileges that the king grants to the nobles in the 13th century in England. So we kind of look at as the beginnings of democracy. No, it's not. I mean, it's not the way we understand. It was the king giving power to the nobles. So this dynamic between nobles and central authority, between local sources of authority, so because you understand, the king ruled by relying on his local sources of authority because he could, there was no set of institutions that he could project throughout the territory. So the nobles themselves had a sphere of authority and you know, their people and their retinue and so on and the king was recognized either by being the son of the previous king or because the nobles elected him, like in Poland, he had power in as much as he could count on the support of these nobles through various, either by giving them things, granting them privileges, getting them to the court, convincing them, forcing them, coercing them, and so on. You see here a source of instability. And the, the, the history of many countries, including, as I mentioned, in you know, read Shakespeare of England, is the history of the, the struggle between local sources of power and the sort of central source of power. Yeah, this will be the undoing of, of Bosnia, for example. And uh, in both Poland and Hungary you will have a, a very strong nobility, but not stronger for most of history than the king. It's always a tension, but for most of it the king kind of prevails, although sometimes you have the nobles prevail. In fact, the undoing of Poland will be because at, the, at the moment when central authority breaks down because the nobles cannot agree to appoint a king. Right? That's the problem between you know, uh, local power and central power. Uh, so this is a struggle. Yeah, this is a struggle. Um, but that's important because both in Poland and in Hungary, the nation, in understood, not in the way we understand it today as a culture, not as we understand it today as a group of people who speak the same language, that's not, had nothing to do with it. I don't care what language you speak. The nation was the body of the, the political body of the country. Those who mattered politically. So the nation, both in the Hungarian state and the Polish state, were the nobles. They were but the political body of the nation. They were the entity. When we talk about Hungary, we talked about the nobles. 
Now understand that the Polish nobles, for example, spoke many languages. They were, they were from very different ethnic groups. But they belonged to the Polish nation, politically. They formed what Poland was. You see, this, this understanding of what a nation is changes in the 18th, 19th century. But we shouldn't project it backward. Because what language you spoke, whoever was cultivated spoke what? Latin. Okay, so there is a rise of the uh, nobles, uh, and there is a document in the 13th century which in Hungary gives the uh, power to the nobles. An important moment is the 13th century. Um, so let's go to 1300, because look at... Um, uh, let's, let's look at it on both maps. Because in the 13th century you have... Look at this green patch. The Golden Horde. What was it? Was this a state called the Golden State? No. These were Mongols who invaded throughout Asia, invaded the Eastern Slavic Russian territories, and got up to Central Europe. The raids of the Mongols in these areas are one of the great traumas of, of the history. And you, you all, uh, you know, uh, in the history of all these uh, states, nations, peoples, peoples, uh, and you can read about them. So here's a pressure from the East, these raiding Mongols, who came basically just to plunder. That's what it was. Uh, nothing special there. Uh, but hugely powerful. So you see, it gets to Poland, gets to Hungary and Hungary, and these countries, all these Central Europe, Eastern Europe, has to fight the Mongols. Later on, they'll have to fight the, the Ottoman Empire. Struggles from Asia. Asia invading, so to speak. But notice what is Asia is a different cultural sphere. Okay, um, it, they, this was so devastating that literally, I mean, the lands were devastated. It took a whole period of reconstruction to rebuild the country after these raids in the 13th century. Um, by the end of the... But, okay, so here's 1400. Look, uh, uh, you can notice that, again, it's a, it's a large state, the Hungarian state, right? But by this time, the nobles have a little bit more power than the king because reconstruction meant getting resources to reconstruct and no king had these resources, so they had to give more privileges to the nobles in, ex in exchange for which he, the king, uh, received support. And uh, an important moment here is the rule of Charles Robert of Anjou, uh, Charles Ro Robert, Robert of Anjou, of the French Anjou house who related to the Arpad house of Hungary, who takes the throne of Hungary, and remember he also uh, will also take um, the throne of Poland for a while. And there's this historical relationship and kinship that Polish and Hungarians sort of have this shared historical friendship, so to speak, for various reasons. But also because their political culture has been the same, also because they have never really been uh, neighbors in a friction-like way, they have been kind of equal powers, and, and also because both of them have been nations of nobles, so uh, common political culture. Uh, let me end on the, on the note that um, on two, with two issues, the discussion of Hungary is that this is also the big, probably the beginning of this 14th century of the doctrine of the Holy Crown. So here's the Holy Crown, so the Holy Crown, which you can see in Budapest, in the building of the parliament, it's, it's activity there. So the doctrine here, why is this important? Because it's politically important. Um, the, 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 the story is that this crown was the crown of Saint Stephen. Why is this important? Because when Saint Stephen died, he died without heirs. The Arpa dynasty doesn't come directly from Stephen. His son died when he was young. So Stephen his before death understand that not having a, a successor means that what you have built, this, this state, will probably crumble. So you can imagine that he has devoted his life to establishing, to building up this state and then nothing. It's like abolishing the constitution after President Obama leaves office and Speaker Boehner and whatever. Abolishing the constitution. Right? It's chaos. Right? But that's what you have to understand how, how what it meant. So the, the, the story is that uh, him being a very devout person, he gave the crown of Hungary, which is the symbol of sovereignty of the Hungarian state, 
Not having whom to give it, he gave it to the Virgin Mary. He offered it up to the protection of, of uh, the Virgin Mary. Right? That's, the, that's the story. And then, so that means that the crown doesn't belong anymore. The sovereignty of Hungary, what's the symbol here? Doesn't belong to a person or to a dynasty. But it belongs to the body politic of Hungary itself. To whose care it is entrusted. And who is the body politic? It is the nobles. But remember, the nobles don't have this, don't possess this. It's just like something that is entrusted to them. So when whoever ruler, whichever ruler takes power, it's like, it is like a constitution. So the Holy Crown understood it like a constitution. This is a symbol of sovereignty. Which doesn't belong to anyone, but it's granted. It's like you're elected president, you don't own America. You just fulfill a function. That's the doctrine of the Holy Crown. This will be, uh, you know, it, it, there's debate that, you know, how clear this was, and it was in and out, maybe is this a rereading of history and so on. But anyway, there is this doctrine, which is also, it's an interesting way of bypassing the insecurity of history. Because if there is this crown that signifies the sovereignty of Hungary as a state, then it doesn't depend on which dynasty rises, falls, and so on, because it's not linked to their particular fate that the, the Hungary persists as a state. Um, and when we get later to the Austria-Hungary, the empire, the, we'll see why it's called Austria-Hungary, and how the emperor of Austria was also, and separately, the king of Hungary. as two different functions, because the, this is a specific function. Okay, um, let's move to, um, to the Romanian lands. Well, remember that we talked about uh, the fact that after the fall of the Roman Empire and the nations, uh, you know, who were conquered by the Romans and so on and so on, uh, remember that for we, historically we don't have clear information of, of what happens to the local native population because they didn't leave many uh, marks. Right, clearly not writings, uh, and politically they had no organization, as you can see. Right? And this is also a period when the Hungarians settled and settled to a part of what the Dacians used to inhabit. Right? Um, and the these are the political units in the year 1000. There's nothing here. This used to be you know, Roman controlled territory up to here. Before that, before 0 and 100 AD, it was the Dacians. The Jeto Dacians, who were the ancestral, you know, well organized and with a solid culture, uh, you know, uh, material culture that you can still find here. But then you have five, six centuries where you don't have written. But remember, this is the early Middle Ages, for lots of places because political system, because the Roman Empire falls apart, there is nothing to replace it. So you don't have these marks of, you know, political organization, which means that you don't, uh, not having a political strong political uh, authority means that culture cannot persist and flourish and develop because there is no stable order it's a vulnerable area so you don't have this what you have instead in these lands is uh, what you see is well, Hungary has a state, Poland, Poland has a state the Byzantine Empire is here maybe the Bulgarians if you remember but that's about it you see? Bulgarians and that's about it so in fact, the first states that would be established on the territory of the today's Romania that are, are, are more native, right, uh, will only come about in the 14th century. Uh, so this will become a huge subject of debate between uh, Hungarians, Romanians, especially, because Hungary will be the large state in the area, uh, and your book talks about the debate. So I'm not going to go into this; it's enough to talk later. In the 14th century, however, you have the, and then later in history, you have the emergence of three um, major uh, entities. And these will be, we can't talk about Romania because, as I mentioned, Romania as a name is only invented in the 19th century. What we have in 12th history is Transylvania, Moldova, or Moldavia, and Wallachia. And these were three different provinces that emerged in the 14th century, uh, a little bit earlier. Transylvania, Moldova, and Wallachia. They were very different, and the, the, the major differences between Transylvania and Moldova and Wallachia. If this is, let's see if I can point it out. 
1300, you see already you have Moldavia, 1400 you have Wallachia, right? Poland actually controls Moldavia, right? Um, probably you will not see it here, yet yeah, in Moldavia. Right? So the point is that if this is today's Romania, this is kind of how Romania looks like today, okay? So the western part and the central part would be Transylvania, the northeastern part would be what used to be Moldova, and the southern part, mainly without this, would be Wallachia. Right? So west, center, and west versus northeast, southeast. And this will this why is this a difference? Because this will be also the difference. The division that I talked about so many times already about between West and Eastern culture, West and Eastern Christianity, will fall right here. Now, there is no Romania, so I can't say it will fall through Romania because there is no such thing, right? But will fall between these entities. And also their ethnic composition will be different. Transylvania will be mostly populated, again, mostly under Hungarian rule, and also this is where Hungarians settled in large numbers, and Germans settled. Uh, there are actually four t different populations in Transylvania, Hungarians, settlers, or Seke, which are Turkic people who kind of took up Hungarian identity, so let's lump them with the Hungarians. Third, Germanic, or Saxons, but they are Germanic, so Germans, and then Romanians. So, Hungarians and settlers, Germans and Romanians, and in the Middle Ages they were considered four different groups. And they had different political standing and different situation in society, and most of the Romanians were peasants, were poor. Right? So this will be re read in history as well, the oppression of the Romanian population. However, it's not entirely true because, again, the language you spoke didn't really matter. What mattered politically and uh, economically was the rank you occupied, the function you played. So the nobles all spoke, you know, actually spoke Latin. I mean, could, if they were literate and so on. And once you were a noble, you learned whatever language was the currency of the day. So this sort of that ethnic background, I mean, it was, it was nonsense. They didn't play the role we know it today. And they probably spoke various languages and different languages. But anyway, Transylvania has, has this mixed uh, uh, heritage with me. But remember that most of the ethnic Romanians, which we would call today ethnic Romanians, it's also a mix of many other tribes. They were Eastern Orthodox, so that was a clear mark between them, between all, besides speaking, remember, a Latin-based language. So we can differentiate between these groups also because they spoke very different languages, Romanian being Latin, Hungarian being its own thing, and German being German. Right? Plus, this is in terms of you know, the vulgar language. The common language is Latin in terms of what you spoke, in the, you wrote in the, the, those who knew how to write them to at court and so on. But there's another thing that uh, you could differentiate the Romanians from the rest because they were mostly Eastern Orthodox. This is also true for Moldavia and Wallachia, however, had mostly well, Romanian speakers. Let's, let's read backward that way, also, also some, some Slavic as well, and, and Eastern Orthodox. So the division between the West and the East sort of falls here, between Transylvania and Moldova and Wallachia. Transylvania so mostly associated with the West, most of its history under Hungarian influence, even if sometimes it was more independent and more powerful than Hungary. Although they had their own smaller principalities throughout history, mostly associated with Eastern control or influence, which includes the Byzantine Empire, which includes Eastern Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, which includes later the Ottoman Empire. Okay, uh, so let's call them the Danubian, made from Daniel principalities, as the book says, um, which emerged mostly, as I said, in the 400. And the emergence of Wallachia here and Moldova here, there's where Transylvania is part of Hungary, uh, the Hungarian state. Um, uh, you see, uh, these clearly were weaker, because you, you saw Moldova here, now it's gone, Wallachia is here, now it will be gone, because the Ottomans will uh, push forward. And this is the other thing that is important here. Oh, that, by the way, that these two, these smaller principalities, they were never kings, they were princip uh, pr uh, princes, right? So not as high in rank. They, be they weren't as high in rank because they didn't have enough, 
as, as much power. And they didn't have enough, uh, which meant that on their own, which meant that they relied on alliances, which meant that they were vulnerable. So they had to have good relations with the current king of Hungary, the current king of Poland, which for a while took over Poland, Moldova, and so on, the current uh, um, um, ruler of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. It was all this interplay uh, of relationships that guaranteed for them either statehood or a semblance of statehood. Survival as a unit, uh, to their luck, they managed, they managed pretty well in the sense of they will never become completely engulfed in the Ottoman Empire, which will happen in, uh, with the southern Slavs, most of them. And we're going to move to them now. So, um, and by the way, these, the rulers who were stronger here in Balakia and Moldova will fight the Ottomans vehemently. So throughout the Romanian history is mostly a history of fighting the Turks, literally. More than fighting others, especially for Valachia and Moldova. Um, but we'll see that when we talk start at the period uh, 1400 and on. Okay, so let's go to the southern Slavs. The Croats, as I said, who are uh, some of the western most uh, southern Slavs. So here, by the way, is these three principalities I mentioned, Transylvania, or Romania, right? Moldova, Moldavia, or Moldova, and Balakia. Right? So this is in the 14th century. Okay. Um, and this is the crown, uh, this is the, 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 the coat of arms of Moldova. Okay, here's Croatia. Well, look, this is the 11th century. Where is Croatia? As you see, it is part of the kingdom of Hungary. So after Croatia had its own state, which it had before the Hungarian state, um, <coughs> it becomes weaker. And the Croatian throne is offered to the Hungarian king. In the same process I have mentioned. Right? In the, the same process of gaining, ally yourself to a source of authority that can guarantee your protection. And what this will remain for a thousand years. For a thousand years, Croatia will be under, uh, uh, recognized as an entity by which it was meant the nobles, and the nobles will have their own uh, the nobles will have their own uh, sort of a gathering, just like the diet in uh, Poland or the parliament in England, it will be the Sado. In Croatia, which will be the sort of a gathering, because the parliament was the gathering of the nobles, which the king called to get resources from them. That was true in England, true everywhere. Later it becomes something elected, but that's when democracy comes about. Sabor remains throughout basically Croatian history. So again, here's another uh, quote-unquote nation, right, people, where the political body is formed not by the peasants, who didn't know how to write or anything, but by the nobles. They are the Croatian nation. And they are the ones, so the king of Hungary, even when he rules over Croatia, he will deal with the Sabor of the Croatian nobles who is here. Separately with then the, with his own diet in Hungary, and separately with, from the diet in Transylvania. See, those are different sort of parliaments. But again, not elected. The gathering of the nobles there. Uh, so the Croatia will be associated with Hungary politically until 1918. 1918. But understood as a distinct unit, unlike Slovenes, which we covered in the previous lecture, who it's before the year 1000 they become associated with the Bavarians then with the Austrians, and kind of under their protectorate, being a very much, much smaller Slavic group. They're all distinct, they're, they're like slightly more distinct, but they're all, uh, not politically, they will never have their own state. Note, however, also that Croatia is also is, is, is formed of, uh, of several lands, just like the Czech lands are Bohemia and Moravia, uh, what we call today Croatia is actually has the, a smaller sort of Croatia that used to be called Croatia in, even in the Middle Ages, but it's not the same as today's Croatia, but a smaller part of it was called Croatia. Then it has Slavonia, it has Dalmatia on the coast, it has Istria, and it has the free city of Dubrovnik, which used to be just like Venice, its own strong thing. So you see what today is Croatia has all these lands, you see Slavonia closer to Austria and Hungary, Croatia proper, Dalmatia was here, you see Dalmatia, right? 
Um, and uh, where is uh, the world? It should be somewhere here, and so on. You see, different lands. All of them, no, okay, <laughs> will constitute today Croatia. But these different lands will fall under different control. Sometimes Italians will control Istria, uh, Venice will control Dalmatia because it's the coast or Dubrovnik, or Dubrovnik will fight with Venice. So you see all these Croatian lands, I mean, the control over them fluctuate. Not, not also that the Croatian lands are at the, let's say, 14, uh, 1400, not uh, that the Croatian lands, here's Venice, it was a strong, strong power at that time. Controlled parts of today's Albania. So. Anyway, the Croatian lands who are, should be here, but part of the Hungarian state, right? They are the westernmost part of what we call today the southern Slavs, or of the western Balkans, or the southern part of Central Eastern Europe, which meant that they were sort of a borderland with what? What is this? This is the Ottoman Empire expanding uh, westward. And in, I also attached a map of the uh, expansion of the Ottoman Empire throughout the centuries, which really starts in the 14th century in Central Eastern Europe. So it comes from, uh, from the Middle East and it expands up to and will take over even half of Hungary later on in the next, next section of our course. But it will take over the country from the south and take over what used to be Bulgaria, take over uh, the Albanians, the, the Greeks of course. Uh, then we'll take over Serbia, we'll take over Bosnia, and Croatians will for a good while, later on, uh, become basically the fighting force there of, uh, um, uh, against this expansion of the Ottomans. In fact, all these countries are yet another common trait that they all shared, literally all, including the Polish, one of the kings died in one of these important battles, which we'll discuss later. All of them, this is another uh, uh, common part of their history, for Romanians, for Hungarians, for Serbians, for Bulgarians, it was the relationship with the Ottoman Empire. This will be discussed in the next section in more depth. But understand that this was a completely different regime, a completely different culture. It was, you know, an Islamic society, and, and, and it spread in this sense, and the, and, and the taking over, which will last in certain lands here for about 400 years, even five, right? It will be a huge impact, and it, for, for many of these, finding this, this push will be, a, will be a, you know, key for the survival of their state, but also for the survival of their, you know, of their Christian, Western Christian culture. So, uh, that's about the Croatians. Let's talk about the Bosnians, or rather Bosnian lands, because it's hard to, Bosnians don't exist at this point. Uh, we'll see why, because Bosnians, Remember that Bosnia, those who are called today Bosniaks are simply southern Slavs who are Muslim. So that can only happen after the Ottoman Empire has expanded in that way. But Bos the, these Bosnian lands, uh, in, the, in the period that we discussed between 1000 and 1400, uh, Bosnia doesn't exist. Remember that the, the southern Slavs who settled in this area in the 7th century <clears throat> don't really form important states except for Bulgaria, which takes over the entire southern Slav uh, region, and, and Croatia. This is the year 1000. But by 1100, uh, you don't really have, you have a patchwork of smaller states, and the Serbians form some states, and Serbians, we call them Serbians now, uh, form some states, uh, first Bulgarian Empire crushes. So the point is that in the southern Slavic area, except for Croatia, which you see, now why they joined the Hungarian state, because that gave them solid protection, that gave them a stability, that protected their state in a way, even if they became part of, a, a, a part in the sense is like a marriage, right? part of another state. Right? So somewhat under the authority, but also this, this thing. So anyway, uh, in, the, in this area, however, you have smaller states formed. And one of them will be Bosnia, which actually, there will be a feudal state of Bosnia, led by a prince, a governor, so not a king, which forms in the 12th century. So, let's see another 
makes sense. becoming uh, autonomous in 12th century, Bosnia separate from Herzegovina. Remember that today the state is called Bosnia and Herzegovina. Well, why is it called Bosnia and Herzegovina? Because these are two historically two different lands. I right? just lump them together and call them both. Uh, so Bosnia is an area, Herzegovina is another area. Um, and this state expands gradually. So this is why I put here a map of how Bosnia expanded to from 1, from 1180. And that's where it starts, and that's here, the, the orange part, and how it expands, and it takes over, you see, Herzegovina. There it is, Herzegovina. Uh, it even expands and takes part, takes some of the Croatian lands, right, uh, that we talked about, right? So, and even some of the Serbian lands. That later will be Serbia and so on. So it was a, it was a quasi it was a you know pretty significant player, well a noticeable player in the area in the 13th, 14th century. But it has always been played by one important player. It never had a strong king or a strong central rule. The most important actors in this in Bosnia, whatever even when it expanded. Sometimes we have more stronger kings, but this centralized rule never lasted. So you see how important it is to have a strong, continuous source of authority. And it never was true in Bosnia. Furthermore, its society was divided. It was divided, you see, Bosnia follows exactly on the division line. Another one of these examples. In the 1990s, there's a war there. For why? Right? Because you have different nations fighting. Well, why aren't there different? Because historically, there have been different cultural influences that have shaped different cultures for the different groups of people, and they, in the 19th century, would define themselves as different nations. Why did the Americans fight the British? Oppression? Well, or is, was it because they consider themselves to be different? Maybe both? Maybe. So you see how important it is to uh, how you define yourself and what you consider yourself in an age starting with the 18th, 19th century, when what you are is also supposed to be uh, defining uh, what state you're in. I'm American, I need to have my own country. Why? Why? Right? The same process will happen everywhere in the world in the 18th, 19th century. Right? This is when you're going to become very important. This question is, what are you? Who are you? Because then you're going to claim your own state. You're going to find the other guy who claims the same territory. Was the war of you know, the colonies with Britain, but also the colonies with Canada. 1812, the states with Canada. They wanted to expand it. Canadians said, no, we're different. See, it's not so, it's not so strange. Um, so, anyway, another, the important thing is that you have, deep, you have never had a central power. And that's a curse on the history of this specific area. Because it means that if you don't have a central power, you can't resist stronger. Powers were pushed towards. So when the Ottoman Empire pushes it, it says it, it doesn't find resistance. It will find resistance in Hungary because there's a strong Hungarian state, the Polish because there's a strong Polish state, the Croats because they're a part of the strong Hungarian state. Even in the uh, Romanian or Danubian principalities, they will find resistance because there is a prince in Valachia, there is a prince in Moldova, he has the resources to mobilize, to defend. Not here. And another reason for the, 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 this weakness is the fact that culturally they were not united either. Because they were actually not one, not two. You would say, okay, there's a Catholic church probably and an Eastern Orthodox. No, no, no. There are several churches. There's a Bo Catholic church, there's an Orthodox church, and there's a Bosnian church, which was kind of a fringe, you know, it was, um, broke itself from the Catholics, from the Catholic church. And this was all, this, this were, this were also a fringe area at the farthest reaches, in a way, of the Eastern Orthodox churches. Serbia is here, remember? Sort of the farthest reach of the Catholic Church, so not well established. And when you don't have